Now I'm going to talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus. And I'll start by stating the theorem, and then we'll work a couple of simple examples. And then I'll come back after that and explain to you why the theorem has to be true. And I'll be giving a geometrical argument that will hopefully elucidate some of the important points about it. So first of all, the statement of the theorem. The fundamental theorem of calculus states that the integral from a to b of f of x dx equals, and before I say what it equals, let me say this. When you see that, the integral from a to b of f of x dx, what should automatically pop into your head is a mental picture something like this. Some x set of x, y axes with some function f of x, and then two points a and b, and that's these points here, a and b, and those points serve as a left and right boundary or a lower limit and an upper limit for this area. So the area bound by the graph and the axis and then those a and b values, that area is this, the integral from a to b of f of x dx. And the fundamental theorem of calculus says that that area is equal to g of b minus g of a. And this function g that just showed up, g is the antiderivative of this function f. So we'll take note of that. It's equal to g of b minus g of a, where g is the antiderivative. is the antiderivative of f. So this, this theorem isn't just a mathematical statement. It tells us how to calculate this area. If we want to find the area underneath this curve right here, between these two points, what we need to do is take this function f and find the antiderivative. The antiderivative of that function will be another function, and we've called it g. And then we just find function g evaluated at point b and function g evaluated at point a and we subtract. And that will give us this exact area. Okay, let's look at an example. Here we're told find the area under the graph of f of x equals x squared from x equals 1 to x equals 2. So this is a simple graph, this parabola. So let's, let's draw it. I'll just put some points on the graph here. x, 1, 2, 3, 4, and my y-axis, I'll mark it off, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then let's plot some points. This parabola we know goes through 0, 0, 1, 1, and 2, 4. Pretty simple, well-known graph, and it looks something like this. Okay, that's the parabola, f of x equals x squared. And we're looking for this area from 1 to 2. Okay, the area under the graph, that area. And the, the top edge of this shape here is not a straight line. That's a curve right there. So we can't just calculate the area of a trapezoid because it's not a perfect trapezoid. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to find the antiderivative of this function. So what's the antiderivative of x squared? That would be the integral of x squared dx. Well, that's pretty easy. It's x cubed over 3. And that's what we call g in our statement of the theorem. So I evaluate function g at x equals 2 and at x equals 1, and then I subtract. So I'm going to find g of 2 minus g of 1. And that's pretty easy. g of 2 is just going to be 2 cubed over 3. And g of 1 is just going to be 1 cubed over 3. So it's 2 cubed over 3 minus 1 cubed over 3. That's 8 thirds minus 1 third. And that's our answer, 7 thirds. And that was pretty easy to do. And not only that, but that's the exact area right there. It's not an approximation. That is exactly the correct answer. And we found it. And um, I'll show you a notation here that's important to know because it's very, very common. This evaluation of this function from, uh, from 1 to 2, the area from 1 to 2, it's commonly written like this. 
I would write x cubed over 3. You put a vertical line and you write a 1 and a 2. And these are what we call the lower limit and the upper limit. And all this means is exactly what we did. This means put the, put the variable 2 in for x and evaluate the function. And, and then put the value 1 in for x and evaluate the function. So this is exactly what we just did. 2 cubed over 3 minus 1 cubed over 3. And it came out very nicely to 7 thirds. And that's easy to do. That's a lot easier than chopping it up into a lot of little pieces, doing all these calculations for a Riemann sum or for a trapezoid. And not, not only are those a lot of calculations, but they're inexact. This is a very simple calculation, and it's exact, and it's easy to do as long as we can find this function, the antiderivative of the given curve. Here's one more example. Starting from rest, a rocket accelerates for 7 seconds, and the acceleration is given by this function, 1.2t squared. Now note that this is non-constant acceleration and we're asked how fast is the rocket moving at the end of the seven seconds. Now before I solve this, and this is going to be pretty quick to solve, let me say something about the physics here. You might remember some equations from your physics class that look something like this. There's an equation for position x is equal to x0 plus v0 t plus one half a t squared or some variation on that. Um, there's equations like this uh, v is equal to v0 plus at, that's velocity, is equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration times the time. We had um, equations like this, the final velocity, or um, excuse me, the, the, the average velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus the final velocity over 2. And there's another equation that said v squared is v0 squared plus 2a delta x. And you might be tempted to take some of these equations and start trying to tackle this problem because these are the physics equations for accelerated motion. The problem is these equations all deal with constant acceleration. And that is not the case here. Look at this. Acceleration is a function of time. So the acceleration is not constant. These equations aren't going to help us. But what will help us is understanding that velocity is the derivative of the position dx dt and acceleration is the derivative of the velocity dv dt. Those principles always apply. So with that in mind, let's solve the problem. Okay, let's make a, a just a quick sketch. The acceleration is going to look something like this. Acceleration as a function of time. It's going to be some kind of parabola and we want to go from 0 to 7 and we're trying to find this area under the graph from 0 to 7. That will be the change in velocity. The area under the acceleration graph is the change in velocity. And if it starts at rest, the change in velocity will be how fast it ends up moving. So we solve this. The change in velocity will be that area. That's the integral from 0 to 7 of a dt. So we just need to find the antiderivative of function a. So what function has 1.2t squared as its derivative? Well, that's going to be 1.2 times t cubed over 3. And then we evaluate that from 0 to 7. And that means we put in the value 7 in for t and get an answer, and the value 0 in for t and get an answer, and subtract. So it's going to be 1.2 times 7 cubed over 3 minus, and you don't even need to write this because this one is 1.2 times 0 cubed over 3. You can leave that off. That clearly is all 0. So you just have 1.2 times 7 cubed over 3, and you do the calculation, and it comes out to 137.2. And that's your answer. That could be in meters per second, or whatever unit we might be measuring in. But 137.2 is the exact area under this curve, and the area under the acceleration graph is the change in velocity. And let me just add that for a rocket, this is reasonable. A rocket would be expected to behave with a non-constant acceleration because as a rocket is flying along through space, remember, how does a rocket propel itself? It blasts all this fuel out the back. And so as it flies, its mass decreases. And as its mass decreases, 
its acceleration increases. So the acceleration isn't constant. And there are plenty of other cases where acceleration isn't constant. But we can still solve these problems, although now we need calculus, because we can't use the constant acceleration equations from physics. Calculus, though, comes to the rescue and allows us to find exact answers to problems like this.